I thought that in the time we have left, I'd give you a final exam. Um, and the way I thought I would do that would be to present a little bit about immigration uh, and taking care of uh, immigrant uh, patients and see what you've learned, help get you to think through some cases with me, or a case. Um, so I want you to learn, think like a doctor, that social issues can be as important to determining a person's health and well-being and longevity as biological issues. What do we do? One of the main pillars of the way you think as a doctor is you say, what risks or exposure has this person have? And given those risks and exposures, what kinds of problems or illnesses might they get? And then how do we frame our treatments and our responses after that? So um, <clears throat> the United States is the country with the highest number of immigrants in the world. Um, and California is the highest, is the state with the most uh, immigrants in the United States. And we also have the highest uh, number of undocumented. So of course we are going to see many immigrant patients in our practices. It's commonplace to say that this is the U.S. history. Each era has had its wave of um, immigrants coming uh, to this country and that has shaped who we are um, as a country. Here are some uh, folks coming to Angel Island in the 19th century. So here's a graph that I think is really interesting. This orange line here is a line showing the percentage of the US population that are foreign born. And here we are in the 19th century with about, in the area, uh, in the era of grand immigration, about 15% of the US population were immigrants or were foreign born. This blue line is the absolute number of people that were immigrants. So fast forward from the era of great immigration, there was a dip a little bit in the percentage of people who were foreign born. And here we are back again in a time of where we're almost reaching the same percentage of people who are foreign born as a uh, part of our population. Now about 13% rather than 15% back at, in the 19th century. And you can see that in terms of absolute numbers, that skyrocketed. About half of our, the foreign born who are here in the United States are citizens. Um, the other half are not and of the other half, about a quarter are undocumented. Another way of giving a perspective on this is to say that about a quarter of um, those people living in the US are either foreign born or the children of foreign born. So a big part of our population. <clears throat> our era has been dominated by a um, influx of people from Latin America and South Asia. Um, you can see in the 60s, after the Second World War, most of the people coming here were from Canada and Europe, but that's changed uh, tremendously. Undocumented uh, um, immigration, uh, there are about that quarter um, <clears throat> of, of uh, foreign-born folks who are undocumented. Mostly uh, those are folks from uh, um, Mexico. Um, and there's been a decrease with all of the uh, recent political jargon, a decrease uh, in the folks that are coming. Um, <clears throat> now most of the undocumented folks are part of mixed status families. About two thirds of the people who are undocumented have lived in the US for over a decade. And many children, US born children, have at least one undocumented uh, parent. So these are really people who are part of their communities. There really are very l few generalizations we can make about immigrants in this country. Um, <clears throat> demographers like to talk about the hourglass uh, of immigrants. So people who are immigrants are both very highly educated and very wealthy and uh, people who are poor with very low educations. In fact, 
What do you think? Are you more or less likely to have an advanced degree if you're foreign born or if you're native born? Any guesses? Foreign born. Foreign born. You're more likely to have an advanced degree if you're foreign born. How about are you more or are you more likely to have less than a third grade education if you're foreign born or native born? Foreign. Same thing, foreign born. So um, also, 20% um, of our low income workers are immigrants. That's the bottom part of that, uh, of the, the pyramid. But 25% of our physicians are immigrants. 22% of people in science, technology, engineering, and medicine are, are immigrants. So it's very hard to make any gross uh, generalizations about uh, immigrants. So in summary, uh, in summary, about 25% of our population are either foreign born or their children. Very difficult to make generalizations and undocumented people are integrated into our uh, communities. Okay, so here comes part of the test. Here's Ms. Chen, and Mrs. Chen is a 74 year old woman. She has a history of high blood pressure and she comes to you, um, you guys are now in medical school, uh, with palpitations and shortness of breath for a few weeks. She has no cough, she has no fevers or chills, she has no weight loss, uh, and no shortness of breath when she lies down. That's something we ask about when we're asking about if somebody has a heart problem. She only takes medicines for her high blood pressure. She's never smoked or drunk. Her heart, uh, her heart, blood pressure is normal. Her heart rate is a little fast. She's oxygenating well. And she has a normal exam, except she has some swelling in her legs. OK, I want you to think about that. And then I want uh, to ask, what are some of the most important questions we need to know about her? So here is one. Where is she from? Was Miss Chen's, were her, some of her, was her foremother one of the people who got off in that picture? Or did she come from, uh, um, did she come from China? Because I'm going to think of, we are going to think of very different things depending on that answer. So, and what's her history of immigration? How long has she uh, um, been here? Okay, so, um, one of the things that you've learned from us, I hope, is that, again, we think so much about risks. And so when we're taking care of a patient who has a history of immigration, we have to think about all of their risks. And so here's one way of categorizing many of their risks. What are the health risks of their native country? What are the health risks of their travel? And what risks do they assume once they come to the United States? So let's just talk first about health risks of their native country. So native country, the way I can make this easiest uh, for you to understand would be, how would you feel if I told you where you were sitting next to somebody who has a fever? Yeah, oh well, mm, not so bad. But how about if I told you that person uh, um, just came during, let's say a year ago, just came from Liberia and had a fever? Your ideas about what might be possible, that you might be sitting next to somebody who has Ebola, might be very different. So the way we think about uh, what somebody might have been exposed to really gives us a sense of what kinds of illnesses they might have. So there may be higher risks of infectious diseases. Um, there are different geography of genetic uh, diseases. So somebody from Greece might come uh, with sickle cell anemia, uh, uh, for example. Um, there may be more environmental uh, exposures. Um, and there are more and more uh, chronic illnesses. There are also uh, there's an epidemiology of stressors. What's going on uh, in that country? What might have brought the, these folks to our uh, shores? Certainly, I think that in that sense, keeping up with uh, current events is as important for a doctor um, as keeping up with the medical literature. Um, I remember seeing a patient, for example, who had been worked up multiple times for having palpitations. And I was asked to see her, and it turned out she was from Rwanda. And so it was, came clear to me. It was easier for me because, of course, other people had done cardiac workups. But it was clear to me that her palpitations came from something 
it came through her heart, but came from something other than her, uh, something wrong structurally with her, uh, with her heart. And finally, you need to know a little bit about what health care access uh, the patient had in their home uh, country and what practices they might have uh, um, done, both for you to have a sense of um, what kinds of things they might, the way they might conceive of uh, medical care, but also certain risks. I had a patient um, once in the hospital who came, she had rheumatoid arthritis and she was taking a medication from China that has been outlawed here because it essentially it kills off the bone marrow. And that's what had happened to her. We didn't figure it out until we got her daughter to bring in all of the medications and sent some of them to poison control that we found out why she was so, so sick. So we also need to think about uh, the risks of travel, both the initial travel and recurrent travel. So um, I had a patient recently, I'd taken care of most of her, um, of her family, and um, she was here from Ethiopia. And I thought, because I've known her family, that she had just come on the airplane. And I said, oh, how was your trip? She said, well, it was kind of tough. And I said, oh, tell me about it. And she, it turned out, had been in jail um, in Ethiopia. She'd gotten out and told that if she ever got back to jail, she might not get out. So she flew to Dubai. From Dubai, she went to Russia. From Russia, when she went to Colombia. From Colombia, she walked across the border in California where her family picked her up. I would never have known that story and all of the risks that might come along with it if I hadn't asked her uh, um, about her risk of initial uh, travel. Travel is hard. Uh, people leave behind their families. Uh, um, they come uh, oftentimes with great expectations uh, or from areas of war. And how they experience that depends on so many different uh, factors. Um, what they find when they uh, get here, whether they're isolated uh, or not. Um, what happens to their social status? Are they coming here and becoming uh, um, uh, a doctor or getting educated? Or are they coming here and sending back uh, money and sometimes failing to do, uh, to do that? In the European literature, um, there has been a lot of discussion about this issue of migratory grief. And one Spanish psychiatrist has talked about the Ulysses syndrome, which I Love. If you remember uh, Ulysses, Ulysses was a general during the Trojan War. And at the end of the Trojan War, he really wanted to go home. But his ship kept being blown from island to island, and he got off track. And one of the islands he landed on uh, was the island of Circe. And Circe was this beautiful demigoddess nymph. And she fell in love with Ulysses. And she offered him immortality if he would stay with her forever and be his lover, be her lover. And for him, this was a torture because all he wanted to do was to get back home and see his wife and see his child and to think of living forever and ever without ever the opportunity of going home just totally broke his heart. And so the, psycho the, psychologi the psychiatrist in, uh, um, in Spain has used this story to describe how difficult uh, um, the issue of leaving your homeland can be uh, for uh, many, many people. Um, in this area of grand uh, um, immigration. And for those who feel it most, they can have this prolonged sense of grief uh, um, with many, many symptoms, some of which um, may come into the medical clinic as headaches or insomnia or abdominal uh, discomfort. Um, there, whether or not there is more there are more issues of mental health in people who are immigrants. It really depends on why uh, um, they left and uh, um, whether they're refugees or not. Uh, many refugees, people who are uh, fleeing persecution, come with much more uh, um, uh, PTSD and anxiety and depression. Um, and it, um, 
the stress and uh, mental health issues come also from who's left behind, um, whether or not a person can go home uh, or, or not. So these are issues that sometimes um, people will never get to, doctors will never get to if we don't ask about um, the immigration stories. Now, <clears throat> another area of travel is going back and forth. And our immigrant patients are, are our highest risk travelers. And yet they almost never get any travel advice. Why? Because we forget to ask as doctors, but also because they think, oh, I'm going home. They don't think of the, the going home as being something exotic. And yet, uh, our um, immigrant patients are our highest risk travelers because they're most likely to go out into the rural area and eat grandma's uh, food or sleep with their uh, um, girlfriend, um, or they can't afford to get their teeth fixed here, so they go home and get their uh, um, teeth fixed. So all of these are big uh, issues. Medicines from home we talked about. Then, of course, there are all the risks of coming to the adopted country. And um, there are many risks of US life, um, different epidemiology of disease, higher risk with uh, um, environmental risks, and a whole litany of re things that can be more stressful, as we talked a little bit about when we talked about migratory stress. Certainly executive orders, here's one uh, from the Second World War with the Japanese internment uh, camps, and certainly there have been executive orders more recently as well that have caused people significant uh, stress. So living in the United States, many of the occupational risks are high. Um, there are whole new chronic diseases, so um, met much more, for example, diabetes in the United States uh, um, in immigrants than in other uh, uh, countries. So we need to work on preventing these things, and then high community risks as well. Legal issues are um, a big uh, issue as well. Uh, for people, so in terms of undocumented uh, folks, and particularly, there's a lot of uh, there are a lot of um, issues in terms of access to care. Uh, um, and uh, let me just bring up a couple of uh, one example of access to care. Um, dialysis, uh, which is if your kidneys fail, you can have a machine that essentially does the job of the. Uh, of the kidney. Um, and if you need dialysis, almost everybody in the US, except for folks who are not documented, will get immediate coverage. If you're undocumented, there are two different policies um, that um, different states use uh, to help people who are undocumented with dialysis. So in one, people will, if they come in, really sick, about to die, they'll get dialysis. They might get it in the uh, emergency room, and they will be sent out and not told to return again until they're at the point of death again. That happens in Colorado, Texas. Um, that costs quite a lot, and people die at a much higher rate. In California and a few other uh, states, we, um, when somebody is undocumented and gets uh, dialysis, they get emergency Medicaid, and they will be brought in and dialyzed on a routine way um, with much less, um, uh, a much lower mortality and much better outcomes. So there are real policy differences that can change some of the stressors that um, accompany being a um, undocumented immigrant. There are big policy changes that um, um, have an impact on children uh, as well. Um, and many undocumented uh, parents, re remember I was talked about the mixed uh, families. Um, because families are mixed, there are many US citizen children um, who are in families of great uh, stress or in positions of great stress because their parents may be uh, uh, deported um, and their parents will, may forego care for themselves and care for their children for fear of deportation. 
Fear is a great barrier uh, for people to coming in and getting uh, um, uh, care. Um, and that has been shown in multiple studies. And we're seeing it, too, uh, at our uh, hospital. OK, so let's go back to Mrs. Chen. She, a uh, 74-year-old woman, she's from China with a history of high blood pressure, and she's coming in with her shortness of breath. So we found out that she's been in the US for 30 years, and she lives with her children. She's had a grandson recently come and visit. She was re-educated during this cultural revolution, and she's just come back two weeks ago from a trip from China where she went to visit her dying sister. Her grandson has overstayed her visa, his visa. OK, so applying the, this rubric, tell me some of the things that you think might be causing her shortness of breath. Stress. What? Stress. Stress. OK, great. Her grandson's overstayed her, uh, his visa. She's stressed out. She may have some post-traumatic stress disorder. What else? TB. What? TB. 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 Could she have, exactly. Could she have tuberculosis? Absolutely. She's just come back. What did her sister die of? She's just come back from China. She might have had uh, TB from uh, before as well. What else? Sleep disorders. Sleep disorders, exactly. Maybe she's, uh, she's gained a lot of weight since she's been uh, here, and she's having more problem uh, with sleeping. Great. OK, well, um, you guys get the idea. There are many, many different things that she could have. So um, she had uh, wood, smoke, wood smoke exposure can cause asthma. Could it be that? Uh, um, many of the things that you guys have brought up uh, along um, here. It turned out, actually, this is um, funny, it's none of these things at all, but in long airplane rides over 10 hours, there's a much higher rate of um, blood clots in the legs. And uh, she ended up having a blood clot going to her lung because of that long airplane ride. But if I hadn't asked her about her travel, if we didn't know uh, that she was going to China, uh, we wouldn't have been able to care for her adequately. And if we hadn't considered all of these things, we wouldn't, uh, um, uh, we wouldn't have cared for her adequately. So I think you guys just passed the final exam. Thank you. Thank you.